I'm excited for you to hear part two of the series on raising rabbits on the homestead with Laura Cox from Cox Homestead. This is it was a really great conversation, and like I said in the part one, if you have not listened to that, it's um, episode 54. But in part one, I I shared how this is I'm unfamiliar with raising rabbits for meat, and also wanted to make sure that you know that we talk about raising rabbits for meat uh, more in this in this episode and so there if you're sensitive to the topic you know just be aware of that or just don't listen to this part i don't know and don't forget you have until june 30th at 11 59 p.m eastern to purchase the workshop for beginner homesteaders and dreamers at the discounted price this is my june promo so take advantage of that you have a few days left Um, just use the code podcast in at checkout and you will get that discount of 20 over 20 percent off and if you're just now hearing about the workshop for beginner homesteaders and dreamers listen to the end of this podcast i have um, i explain it in the end and i give you all that information again so just take a listen so here we have the part two of the interview with laura cox at cox homestead so the breeding process um now rabbits breed like rabbits. <laughs> so how do you control that? Um, I know that the males are separate, but like, is there any, like, what's your process when you're breeding? Like, uh, sure. you take, yeah. take your, your doe to your buck. Mm-hmm. You never want to put a buck in a doe's cage. So I will take okay. my, my buck and I actively breed middle of August through April. I will not do any breeding in the month of May, June, or July. It's simply too hot for our rabbits here in the South. Mm -hmm. It's not worth the risk. Mm -hmm. Um, There are some breeds of rabbits that are designed. The Texas A&M has a Tamuk rabbit that is designed to tolerate the heat Mm -hmm. very well. Um, I don't have any of those, but if you're in even further climate than me, that might be something you want to look into. Um, But we give our our rabbits the months off in the summer because it is so hot. The bucks go sterile, the does mm-hmm. overheat, and they, they're wearing that winter coat that I talked about mm-hmm. all year long. And so mm-hmm. it's really, really hard on them. If you're in a, a northern climate, you can probably, your, your, your breeding cycle may be reverse of mine. Mm-hmm. Um, and some people still breed year round up north. Uh, but for us here in the south, it's hot and it's it hard, hot going out there to care for them. And mm-hmm. so I feel like they deserve that break. I need that break. Our schedules need that break. And right. So we take off those months. But otherwise, through when I'm in my heavy breeding cycle, I, at four weeks old, when those babies are four weeks old, which their gestation is 28 to 35 days, okay. so usually candling around uh, 31, 32 days. And then when those babies are four weeks old, I will take that mom out, put her in the buck's cage to rebreed put her back in with her babies for two more weeks. And then I wean those babies off at six weeks, leaving behind one or two rabbits to help dry mama up just for a few days. And then I remove those babies and mom has about a week and a half to live on her own before she gets the nest box to kindle again. And so that is the process we have over and over again from middle of August through um, April. Okay. Okay. And the average litter size is around eight rabbits. Okay. And mom and has eight teats. I have had rabbits that had litters up to 14. So okay. when you have larger litters, oftentimes you have what I call faders. And that is some that just don't make it because the litter is so large. Mm. And mama only nurses once or twice a day. And if you have one not strong enough to get to the teat, it just becomes a fader. Yeah, that's an interesting fact about the rabbits that I I didn't realize until we raised. Oh, I forgot to mention I've raised several wild rabbits before. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, we raised two um, jack rabbits uh, when we were in California, and um, I I through that process of trying to figure out how to care for them, I fed them goat milk. They we were you know milk had our goat milk our goats at the time, and. Um, through that process, I learned that they only feed, the mother only comes to the nest once or twice a day. And I was like, so we were, I, cause I've tried, I had tried several times to save rabbits before that, because we, you know, they, they'd um, have their litter in a, in our hay or something, or the dog would bring one or something like that. And, um, 
uh, I was thinking the first time I did it, I was thinking they needed to be warm. They don't need to be warm. <laughs> like you don't want to at least wild rabbits. They don't like to be warmed, you know, just, uh, they don't need a heat source anyway. No, no, no. They huddle together to keep warm. Yeah. Their body heat alone works. Together. Yeah. And so that was the first mistake I made. And the second mistake I made was trying to feed them like I would some other kind of animal, you know, that needed regular, a couple of hours or something. Anyway, so those are the first two mistakes I made with the first couple of rabbits that I tried. But the, the jack rabbits, they were a little bit older. They were the cutest things ever. They had the big giant ears. And, um, but I, I recently had another nest in my garden and I remembered like mama's only going to come once or twice a day. So I just better leave this here. And, you know, I left it, I covered it so that make sure that she could get in because it was in a really bad spot. She just put it in tall grass. Um, yeah. So yeah, that is just an interesting fact that I, I learned and I didn't realize the domestic, I don't know why it would be different, but I didn't realize domestic rabbits were the same. Yeah. Yeah. And so I get a lot of messages this time of year, or even have people pull in my driveway with like a box of wild rabbits or something. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't touch them. I don't mess with them personally. Mm -hmm. They carry diseases that can be mm -hmm. um, transmitted to mine. Right. And also oftentimes if you find a litter, someone will, you know, their, their dog will find a, a litter in the yard or the lawnmower will mow over it or, or mm -hmm. something like that. Uh, the success rate of you trying to do some intervention is so low mm -hmm. that I often say it's not worth it or, you know, it, they still may be fine or that mama may have already weaned those babies. Oftentimes in the wild mm -hmm. moms go out and rebreed the same day they've had their litter, if not in mm -hmm. the middle of having their litter, mm -hmm. because that is their nature. That is what they're created to do. And so the time those babies are four weeks old, their mom has done abandoned them and they've yeah. got to figure it out on their own. And so um, if they have their eyes open and they're hopping around, more than likely they're going to survive and they're prey animals. And so their success rate isn't high mm -hmm. anyways, you know, so that's why they have a lot of them <laughs> They have, right. to, have mm -hmm. it all to have their chance to survive. And so yeah. I often tell people, don't even, don't even try and mess with them. Let nature do its thing. Uh, they'll yeah. be more. And Especially the ones big yeah. heart, you know, yeah. have big heart and they want to save them. But yeah. But, and I think that's especially true with the ones with the eyes closed still. I, I believe their need the um, the baby rabbits need something from their mother at that point, and they cannot get it from any other source. Yeah. I don't remember what it what it was exactly, but they need something from them when their eyes are still closed and they're still at that stage. When their eyes are open, like you said, mo more than likely, mama rabbit's actually really close, <laughs> and they'll find her. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I don't even do intervention with my own rabbits. I've tried mm -hmm. a few times to do things, but for the most part, I've 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 done it long enough now that I just let nature run its course and mm -hmm. realize that there's only so much I can do, and so and my time is so valuable. I can only spend so many hours fretting over these little babies. But when Mama goes in to nurse these babies, she also stimulates their genitals, which encourages them to use the bathroom. So mm -hmm. if you are trying to nurse this baby kit with its eyes shut and not moving much, you know, you've got to also stimulate its genitals to get okay. to the bathroom. So That's it's interesting. quite an involved process. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, I take the expired kits, I call them, and either mm -hmm. they are dog treats or they go in my freezer to feed a reptile or a bird or something else. You know, I try to, mm -hmm. or compost them, you know, that's mm -hmm. another great way to use them and not let them go to waste too. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah. Um, how large is your family? I just want, I just want to get like, how many rabbits do you, do you breed for consumption for your family? Yeah. I, my family is a four, um, me mm -hmm. and my husband and two kids and we can eat a rabbit for a meal. Like if I roast it, we'll mm -hmm. eat the whole rabbit. Uh, if I pull it off the bone and add it to a soup or something like that, it will usually last us a couple more meals. Mm -hmm. as the meat is mixed into other things and it goes a little bit further, just like any other meat would. Mm -hmm. um, and we have 15 breeders. Uh, maybe one of those is a pet, I think. So about 14 breeders and we breed nonstop August through April. And I sell quite a few rabbits as well. So it's hard for me to give you an exact how much we eat and use. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would say, so this last weekend we put 10 in the freezer and then this weekend we have another 10 to put in the freezer, 10 or no, we have 12 to put in the freezer. I think it is. So, uh, 
it really just depends on the season, but I would say we probably consume 50 to a hundred rabbits a year. Okay. Okay. That's a good, that's a good to know. That's a good number range. I had no idea. Like, you know, I can think about a chicken. I guess it's kind of like that. Would you say uh, a whole chicken and a rabbit are the same or would you do two to, to one chicken kind of like size wise? Uh, so it depends on the chicken. If you're mm -hmm. doing Cornish crosses, uh, they they get pretty big. So those mm -hmm, yeah. are bigger than my rabbits. Mm -hmm. We process rabbits at 12 weeks old. So they dress about, well, they dress about three pounds. Okay. So I try and get my average dress weight to sometimes okay. it's a little less, sometimes it's a little more. Um, so, and our chickens mostly dress around five pounds. Mm -hmm. so I would say, unless you're leaving your rabbits longer, which you can, you can leave them up to, to 16 weeks without really slowing down your process. It just, mm -hmm. they tend to put on more fat um, beyond the okay. 12 week process and the fur get harder to pull off. Some people wait till, we started out waiting until 16 weeks because okay. we processed the first ones and I was like, there's hardly any meat here. But now that we have so many more um, and I realized how much easier it is to skin them at 12 weeks mm. and work with them that young, we, we do it then. Um, okay. But a lot that, of people wait until there's like five pounds live weight to process. Okay. So, that brings me to the question you mentioned, fat. You know, that, is it true that they don't have, like if you were, you could not sustain yourself on rabbit meat alone because there isn't enough fat? Is that true? I've heard that. Yeah, that's true. Okay. <laughs> and I don't, like, who wants to eat rabbit meat alone? Yeah, I know. I'm just, like, if somebody wants, I, I've heard people, especially with dogs, try to feed their dogs only rabbit meat, and they don't have enough fat for them. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, older rabbits have, I mean, they can have quite a bit of fat, so just okay. on if you want to count that in there, too, but I I wouldn't want to eat rabbit alone. And when I cook rabbit, I don't use, I mean, I use fat. I don't cook it just alone, especially if I'm roasting it or grilling it. I make sure mm -hmm. and add a fat. I prefer bacon grease a lot. And I mm -hmm. use my, my homemade uh, season salt on okay. there quite a bit, either grilling it or roasting it. But no, mm -hmm. you do need to add a fat to it because it is so lean, mm -hmm. which if you have a condition where you're needing to consume less fat, it is a great source for that. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's just, it's so sustainable. They, they essentially yeah. can take, um, just like a cow or a sheep, they take the grass, eat the grass, something that we humans cannot digest mm -hmm. and they turn it into a protein that we need. And so, right. um, the, the, the value that they have of that is invaluable to me, but no, yeah. I, you cannot live on rabbit alone. And that is correct. But yeah. if, who hits the fan and I have to live on rabbit alone, I'm going to say, dear Jesus, take me home. So. <laughs> I guess it would only really affect somebody who's maybe living in the wilderness and that's all yeah. they're eating. Yeah. Uh, but most of us have access to fat everywhere. <laughs> so, Praise the Lord, right? Yeah. I love that. So. Um, what does rabbit taste like? I, I've never had it. What it's, would you it, compare it yeah, to? Yeah, it is a combination of chicken and pork, in my opinion, but a lot of people mm -hmm. say chicken. Um, depends For me, it depends on how you cook it. If you're grilling it or roasting it, which if you do either of those with rabbit, you want to do it at a low temperature for a longer time. You don't want to rush mm -hmm. cooking rabbit because it is so lean mm -hmm. and you want to get it just to temperature and not overcook it or it will be dry. I think it tastes a lot like chicken if you roast it or grill it. If you put it in a pot and boil it and pull it off the bone, it's going to taste more rabbity. And that's where I, mm -hmm. that's where I pull in the pork flavor. It's a little bit different of a flavor than just chicken. When you okay. do it in that fashion, it has a little bit, I guess the word would be gamier, mm -hmm. but I feel like gamier also comes with a negative connotation or a negative mm -hmm. view on it. It just tastes like rabbit. That's mm -hmm. all I can say. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, and it's all how you cook it uh, yeah. too. Uh, we have a, a, a relative that makes really good uh, deer what is it, venison. <laughs> um, and I uh, the first time I tasted it, it, I don't know what game he tastes like because he cooks it so well. So he was, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Just real quick. Give us some, um, the process of the meat processing steps that are not like, we don't need to go into detail, basically sure. <laughs> just like, how do you go from having the rabbit to ha putting it in your freezer? 
there's several different methods you can use. Um, you can use a fatal blow, which would be a shot to the head. You can use cervical dislocation, which can be done with a hopper popper or the broomstick method. Um, and you, or you can do a bop and bleed, which is also a cervical dislocation where you bop the head, bleed the, bleed the rabbit out. All, all the methods, um, except for the fatal blow involve hanging and bleeding out the rabbit. Mm -hmm. And then you start at the feet. We hang them now. We, I've done it on the table. That's how we first started. Now we hang them mm -hmm. and you start by, um, getting the hair off the feet, pulling it down. You, you'll be surprised how easily especially a younger rabbit. If you remember earlier, I was saying that 12 week mm -hmm. mark is this, kind of the sweet spot for an easy scanning process. And um, then you just pull the guts out like you would anything else. And it does need to go uh, through rigor mortis and the fridge for about, I say up to three to five days, up to a week. Um, mm -hmm. We had one, I processed Saturday and then we had it on Tuesday and it was fine. It wasn't okay. tough or anything. So just a few days in there, it needs to go through the rigor mortis process. And we do that in the fridge. You can do it in a dry or wet, either one in the fridge, okay. whichever. So it's not like processing uh, chickens where you put it in an ice bath. You just put it in the refrigerator. Yeah, so you can, you can put it in an ice bath depending on how many you're doing. So like if we're doing a bunch, I'll have a cooler out there where I'll have some ice to keep them cool. Okay. Uh, but unlike chickens that reach a certain age, especially let's say these Cornish cross, if you're not processing them at eight weeks, they're dying of heart attack in your field. And mm -hmm. so rabbits, you don't have that time pressure like you do with chickens. They can go a, a few extra days or weeks or whatever. So you don't have to do them all at once. You don't need a plucker. You don't really need anything fancy like a scalds or anything like that. It's just, uh, you know, skinning them and, and removing the innards and then putting it in. You can do the ice bath, but we typically put them in the fridge, not long, okay. rinse them off and put them in the fridge uh, within an hour or so of processing them. Okay. Well, that is really good information. And I think a lot of people will benefit from hearing all of that because, you know, especially the parts that make you a little uncomfortable need to be heard as well, because this is how we uh, raise livestock. We have to have these conversations. It sounds, it sounds clinical and that sort of things, but that's kind of the, the, the mindset we need to have is that these animals are sustaining us. So, um, I would like to hear your pros and cons list. Um, like, especially the cons list, because we kind of, the whole interview was talking about the pros pretty much, but what is your, like the cons of owning rabbits? I always want to prepare people for, the negative side, uh, other than the cuteness factor, like we mentioned, <laughs> the negative side so that they're prepared for it. So what would you say are the cons of owning rabbits? Well, you know, I feel like I've been doing long enough that it's hard for me to think about this because I've mm -hmm. just, you know, kind of accepted what it is. But I'm thinking, uh, I mean, maybe the bucks can spray. So maybe some mm -hmm. urine on you that you don't necessarily want. Mm -hmm. uh, not all bucks spray, but occasionally you'll get one that's a little feisty. Um, you can get scratches mm -hmm. uh, from handling the rabbits. you got to know how to handle the rabbits. They can leave some scars on you. And there's things you can do, like wearing um, some, some garden sleeves, or I wear a lot of blue jean shirts, things like mm -hmm. that. I've had some clothes ripped from their nails. Um, so there are those things. You do have to trim their nails, especially your breeders. I don't trim the nails of my offspring. But the breeders, I do trim their nails every month or two. Um, cleaning, routine cleaning in the in your your area, you gotta remove the manure, um, clean the cages, that type of thing. Um, you do run into disease pressures with rabbits. Rabbits are a pretty sensitive animal. Mm -hmm. um, I try and reduce as much exposure to other rabbit trees as possible, and also raising our rabbits on pasture you are exposing them to disease as well and so mm -hmm. we have had some cases where we process rabbits from our tractor and every single one of them has coccidiosis mm -hmm. uh, good news is is you can still consume that animal and we just don't consume the liver at that point mm -hmm. so there are some environmental pressures with this humid climate that we live in here in, in the south that could cause you to lose some parts of the animal okay. um I think and th that's all the things that go through my mind besides just the daily commitment to go out and feed and water and care for mm -hmm. them. 
There's not a ton uh, of cost. I don't use a vet. You know, okay. you can get another rabbit for 30 bucks if that one passes. Um, so there's not a ton of cost involved. Okay. That's good. Um, what about uh, just the does um, not raising their young? Like, does that happen very often? They just refuse yeah, or so they... Sometimes first time moms will struggle with their litter. Not always, but sometimes mm -hmm. their first litter will be a challenge. And then uh, if subsequent litters are also a challenge, that's not a mom you want to keep. I think finding good breeding stock will help eliminate that problem. Mm -hmm. um, and knowing your breeders, asking, you know, the people you get them from, like, was the, this, the mom of this baby a good mom the first time around? Or did she struggle a few times? How, mm -hmm. What's her success rate of her litters? You know, is she losing a lot in her litters or is she a hundred percenter? You know, asking some of those questions, I encourage people to get their rabbit from a breeder where they can ask questions versus mm -hmm. going into a store and buying their rabbits there where they don't know anything about the gene lines or things like that. So, okay. Also, another option for finding a good quality rabbit is getting some from show rabbits, depending mm -hmm. on where you're at. I know in California, there's a lot of high quality show rabbits. Californians in particular, those mm -hmm. rabbits, you could get good breeding stock there. Reach out to your local 4-H department or ag office and see who they know are breeders, reputable breeders in your area. But okay. Maybe not just hopping on the Craigslist and, and picking someone may not be the best. It could be, yeah. you know, there could be a reputable breeder on there, but sometimes you have some that are just trying to make a quick buck. And I will say back to the beginning of this, when I talked about everything um, starting in good soil, I think, you know, mm -hmm. knowing the heart and intent behind the breeder and what they're trying to sell you or give you is important. And they're not just trying to make a buck, but rather sell you a quality animal. So getting good breeding stock from the beginning is important. Yeah. And that's true for, all livestock really we yeah. we had a very good uh, very good bloodlines with our our um dairy goats we had la mancha dairy goats and she was like you know show quality does her they they produced a lot of milk a lot of people and they they were all really great does like she bred for personality and you know temperament and all those things and maybe that would um solve some of the problems that people have with, you know, not liking goats or whatever because of their temperament and their, yeah. or something. If you just got, went to a breeder who did that for a living and knew exactly wh where the parents came from and stuff, we had the best goats. I don't know why people throw shade at goats. Yeah. <laughs> now because... Well, and I will say with that, you may pay a higher price, mm -hmm. but typically that higher price is worth it. Right. You're getting the quality and the lineage information and that type mm -hmm. of thing. So yeah. For don't sure. go for the cheapest necessarily because rabbits can be cheap. You can find mm -hmm. some for $10 somewhere or 15 bucks. And if that's all you have access for, go ahead and try it. You may, you may find yourself getting something good, but right. if you can find someone, like she was saying, a reputable person that pours into their animals, it's definitely worth it. Um, what is your favorite part of owning rabbits like is it the meat or is it like just the whole thing like what is your favorite part of owning rabbits my favorite part of owning rabbits is knowing exactly where my meat's coming from and mm. how it was cared for having that relationship with your food is unlike anything i've experienced in mm. the home setting world or even just in the animal husbandry world having that much closeness to your food is quite the experience. Yes, I, I would agree with that. I would agree with that. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of levels to what it means. You know, it's not just you're, you're raising animals for food. It's, there's just so much to it. And I, I can't even put it into words really. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The thankfulness, the deep appreciation. Yes. Because yes. we will use their bones even. I use their bones to make a bone broth. And mm -hmm. then if I just have rabbit bones in that pot, then after that, the bones will go to feed my chickens. And, mm -hmm. you know, because they're so crumbly after making mm -hmm. bone broth. Yeah. So it's it's this beautiful cycle that keeps on giving. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, I agree. Okay. So do you have anything available for our listeners to purchase to help them get into rabbits or any like a YouTube channel or whatever? Yeah, I have a YouTube channel at Cox Homestead. I have a lot of the basic frequently asked questions I get on there. And I do a little bit of vlogging. Uh, not a ton, but you can find me on there. I would love it if you would subscribe and 
leave a comment so that I know that you're there and, and learning. I have an Instagram and that is Cox Homestead underscore Kodak. I have Facebook and that is Cox Homestead Kodak. Our website is www.cox-homestead.com and you can subscribe to my newsletter there. That is where I release all of my happenings firsthand. If you're on my newsletter, you get everything that I'm doing before anybody on social media. Mm -hmm. So I teach a lot of in-person workshops. Um, I teach a gardening 101. We teach how to process rabbits, how to raise rabbits. Um, then I also do some stuff with cut flowers occasionally. And in the, in the wintertime, I have a live wreath workshop and we are continuously adding more things here at the homestead. A lot of it being in person. I really thrive in person teaching. And so we have a short term rental on our farm. So if you are from mm -hmm. out of town, and want to come see the Smokies. We are an excellent spot. We are right off the parkway, um, just a couple miles off the interstate, getting you in the direction to go explore the Smokies, Pigeon Forge, Gatlinburg, and Sevierville. And you have a view of our farm and a thousand acre farm across the road. So it is very scenic. And you can find that on our website as well. On my Etsy shop, I have this shirt here. Oh yeah, I've and seen that shirt. shirt. Yeah. It may not show up, I can't tell. But and it I, says, eat more rabbit. <laughs> I love that. How shirt. I end every one of my YouTube videos. <laughs> and you can see, I just have a few of these left. There's not many. So okay. if you want to support me in the biggest way possible, getting one of these shirts is the answer. I also sell DIY elderberry syrup kits. And um, a cake, like a few times a year, I list my original season salt that you can snag up. So. Okay. Awesome. I love that idea. And I think I will. we will take you up on that offer for the Airbnb. Airbnb because you know we're not that far from each other and we went to Gatlinburg last year so yeah I I really think I need to do this because I I really would love to see what you got there and I can learn from you about yeah. rabbits and uh, see your Airbnb set up there so well I'll have to tell my husband we need to plan that <laughs> you need a weekend away yes <laughs> Well, thank you so much. I this was a great conversation, and I learned so much. Like uh, this was this is a new t new uh, topic for me, and I love learning about things. And I know my listeners um, who are interested in this topic also have learned. So I just want to thank you again so much for coming. And uh, I guess we will we may we may hear I may have you back on to talk about your Airbnb um, business oh. because I know a lot of people want. Um, to learn about that. So yeah. yeah, I would be happy to. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much, Laura. Yeah. Thank you for having me on. Hey there, homestead dreamer. Whether you're just starting out or have already dipped your toes into the homesteading world, I've got something special for you. It's all about setting up a solid foundation for your homestead plan and income strategy through thoughtful action and implementation. Because let's face it, starting a homestead is not too difficult but keeping it sustainable can be a real challenge. Now, the decisions you make in those early years can truly make or break your experience. You either end up feeling confident and content, or you find yourself caught up in a never-ending struggle, like on a hamster wheel. And we definitely want to avoid that. That's exactly why I've created an amazing resource for you, the Workshop for Beginner Homesteaders and Dreamers. With this tool, you'll have a rock-solid foundation to build your homesteading dream upon. In the pre-recorded workshop, you'll dive into some valuable topics such as strategies for planning, savings, and generating an income, how to find and become a part of a supportive homesteading community, and developing the right mindset for homesteading success. And here's the cherry on top. Throughout the month of June, I'm offering my workshop for beginner homesteaders and dreamers at a special discount price. It's an hour and 40 minute video where I personally guide you through most of the Homesteading for Beginners workbook, which is included in the workshop price, by the way. To grab this offer, head over to healthyhomesteading.com forward slash workshop and use the code podcast at checkout. With this code, you'll get over 20% off the already low regular price. But remember, this discount is only available during the month of June, so make sure you take action soon. You can find all necessary links in the show notes of this podcast episode as well. I'm eager for you to get started. Let's make your homesteading dreams come true together.